Hello and welcome to tonight's event titled Economic Democracy, the American Argument. It is organized by Katalys, Jämlikhetsfonden and ABF. And as some of you may know, there is a very large military exercise being held in Sweden right now called Aurora, with around 1,000 US military troops invited to Sweden by the Swedish Armed Forces. So I think it is an appropriate response by the labor movement to also invite some Americans to Sweden. Uh, not to make us better at war, but to make us better at democracy. We have not only one, but two key speakers here tonight, uh, David Ellerman and Chris Mackin. Um, and uh, I will invite them to the stage in a bit. Uh, after an introduction aimed at putting tonight's talk in some wider context. My name is Patrick Witkowski and I directed a film called Can We Do It Ourselves? A film about economic democracy that came out in 2015 and it's freely available on www.economiskdemokrati.se if anyone would like to watch it. Uh, the documentary starts off by pointing out the quite simple contradiction in mainstream Western ideology today. On the one hand, democracy is more or less considered the only legitimate way to run a country or a town. Leaders are supposed to be elected and accountable to the people under their authority. Basically, every political party embraces it, and we even send our own citizens to countries far away to die in wars fought under the name of democracy. On the other hand, most of us spend a big chunk of our lives working in companies where there is no democracy. We do not elect our bosses, and even suggesting democracy at the workplace often makes one considered unrealistic or some kind of utopian socialist. But as David here has written so eloquently about, and we'll be talking about tonight, Calling workplace democracy a socialist idea is a way to dodge a much more fundamental and inconvenient truth about Western civilization. That our whole economic system is based on the renting of human beings. Human beings are today rented by corporations and state organizations without the right to elect their representatives and without the legal right to the fruits of their labor. This is what we in ordinary language call a job. David makes the case that this system ought to be abolished, just like the full-time purchasing of human beings, also known as slavery, has already been legally abolished. Worth noting is that this has nothing to do with the abolishment of, pri of private property. As David puts it, democracy is at war with the renting of human beings, not with private property. Well, if we abolish a system, we need to replace it with something. Here comes the experience from the United States in handy, and that is what Chris will be talking about. In the United States, companies owned by the workers has reached a scale unmatched in much of the world. These companies perform perfectly well in many respects, even within the current economic system. They are not perfect, but then again, nothing in the real world is. Chris writes that the secret sauce behind the success is that in the United States it is possible for groups of employees to become owners of anywhere from 1% to 100% of their companies without risking a single dollar in their company, in, of their own capital, sorry. David and Chris's critique is not only a critique of the capitalist model that is the economic cornerstone of right-wing ideology, it is also a critique of the democratic socialist model where economic democracy has primarily meant state ownership or social ownership of the large corporations. Such an idea underpinned the wage earner fund proposal that the LO and to a lesser extent the Social Democrats tried to push through in the 1970s and early 80s. The idea was that the big Swedish corporations would be taxed and the ownership over these corporations would gradually shift to the LO. The big Swedish corporations would then be part owned by the Swedish workforce as a whole, but the governance rights would be handed over to workers and communities. When the proposal was made public in 1975, the newspaper Dagens Nyheter had a front cover with the title Revolution in Sweden. Even though Stefan Löfven, our current prime minister, 
has said that he got interested in poli politics around the time of the Wage Turner Fund, I have not once heard him talk about an alternative economic system beyond the current one. Of course, he's not the only one to shy away from these important questions. The LO today calls the Wage Earner Fund proposal the result of union hubris. Few people today, especially young people, know what the Wage Earner proposal was. But it was a big battle that the labor movement lost, the outcome of which has had a large impact on the right sharp wing shift the, the sharp right wing shift among Swedish politicians, media pundits, and business leaders over the last 35 years. And of course, the neoliberal turn the country itself has taken, with dramatic tax cuts, privatization of the state, and the deregulation of business and finance. The proposal for the wage earner funds were watered down, and only some investments funds were instituted, primarily to help the corporations themselves with investment capital. Finally, in 1991, the Bildt administration liquidated the funds. This was the same time that the Soviet Union was dissolved, and the political and economic elites of the West thought that the so-called neoliberal model of capitalism would bring about freedom and prosperity for all. That did not happen. The financial crisis of 2007-2008 almost crashed the world economy, and today, slow growth and high unemployment seem to be the norm in both Europe and the US. While the top 1% of the population is pocketing more and more of the new wealth that is created. Still, even though uh, these are the circumstances, it seems like the left have struggled to offer an alternative and clear vision of the economy which could actually solve some of these problems. And that's why we invited Chris and David for this talk to make a principled critique of the present system and a serious vision for the future grounded in empirical evidence of real, wor of real world examples and proud historical traditions. David Ellerman has written about the theory and practice of worker cooperatives and other forms of workplace democracy for over 40 years. In the realm of theory, he developed the modern treatment of the labor theory of property and the associated theory of inalienable rights that implies the abolition of wage labor. He co-founded the Industrial Cooperative Association in 1977 to promote and launch industrial and worker cooperatives in the United States. Prior to retirement, he fought the World Bank from the inside, finishing a speechwriter and senior advisor to Joseph Stiglitz. Chris Mackin is also a co-founder of the Industrial Cooperative Association. In 1984, Chris earned a doctorate in human development from Harvard University with a thesis called The Social Psychology of Ownership, a case study of a democratically owned workplace. In 1987, he founded Ownership Associates, a consulting firm that assists cooperatives and ESOPs. In 2008, he became a partner at American Working Capital, an investment banking group that helps finance employee ownership. Today, Chris also serves as a lecturer on employee ownership at the Rutgers University School of Management and Labor Relations and at the Harvard Trade Union Program. Comments on David and Chris's speech will then be made by David Eklin Klu, who is a political coordinator at the Union of Commercial Employees, Handels, and is also a social democrat, and also Dean Ekman, who is also a social democrat. After that, David and Chris will have a chance to respond to the comments, and then we'll open it up to the audience. The event ends at 8 at latest. So, with that introduction out of the way, please welcome uh, at first David Ellerman and then Chris Mackin to the stage. Thank you, Patrick. Let me get my slides up here. Here we go. So, thanks to Catalyst for the invitation and to Patrick for the introduction. Just a few remarks uh, to sort of frame this. As Patrick hinted, we are trying to really address the left in a very new way, that the old left is exhausted, uh, to say the least, and trying to offer a new approach that is a clean break from what is uh, in the past has, has characterized the left. 
And so I'm going to do the sort of theoretical part behind this, and, and Chris will follow up with some very practical suggestions that have been successful in America. So it's sort of theory and practice uh, uh, thing here. So let me just start, even though I'm, I'm uh, not speaking in America, with a linguistic uh, question. In America, we say people are hired and you rent a car, you rent an apartment, but it's fundamentally the same relationship. It's the relationship from the economic point of view where you're buying the services of an entity, in this case a person, instead of buying the entity itself. That you cannot any longer buy people, but you can rent them. And uh, this, so the, I tend to use this language just to get people to try to think about it anew. I don't, I don't know how this works out in Swedish, but, but uh, everybody seems to speak English here, so uh, that gives us a way to sort of address the question. The human rental system, and that's where, of course, the terminology of neo-abolitionism comes from. Abolitionism was about abolishing the whole institution of owning other people. And we're talking about abolishing the institution of renting people, so that only things will be rented and human beings will not be rented or, uh, or owned. And this is, the language is not controversial. The first Nobel Prize winner from America was Paul Samuelson, sort of the dean of <coughs> neoclassical economics. And you see the quote there where he points this out. Uh, the second quote is also from a uh, textbook, uh, this one published in Europe. Stanley Fisher, the Fisher there uh, is a distinguished American economist. He's the second person at the US uh, Fed, Federal Reserve Bank. He was slated uh, probably to become the new Fed if, uh, if the current head of the Fed uh, leaves, but it seems he has a medical problem and, and will, will retire. He's announced his retirement. But he's, these are both distinguished economists that they're perfectly aware that the wage labor, the employment relationship, the whatever you want to call it, master-servant relationship, is basically the renting of people. So I'm not making this up. This, this is non-controversial. And the, the uh, second point here, also, also non-controversial, is that if you think in terms of legal parties, the, the uh, and, and now I'm warming up to sort of a property uh, theoretic argument, the, the party that appropriates both the whatever is produced in, a, in an economic enterprise and also, as it were, appropriates the liabilities, in other words, covers the liabilities and sells the output, uh, is the employer. And the employees, as employees, have no, no share of that. So the, their share of what they produce, both positive and negative, is zero. And this is upsetting to economists who love the sort of metaphor of the sort of the employees are like partners in the enterprise and you have this theory about marginal productivity, that how much is distributed to each one. But in fact, if you if you set aside metaphors for a moment, as, as economists, if they want to pretend to be scientists, should do, in fact, employees have zero percent of the product own, ownership and zero percent of the liabilities create an enterprise charged against them. So they don't, uh, they are simply a rented entity and they receive the <coughs> rental payment and the wage, uh, the same as a, if you rent out a truck or a machine or something else, so they only represent a cost uh, item in the enterprise. And as I said, this is contrary to the metaphor that you'll see in any economics course uh, of the distributive shares, as if the only question was who uh, gets how much uh, for capital, how much for labor, and so forth. So we are asking a very different question, a different question of who is to be the firm in the first place. And the language uh, sometimes adopted for that is the question of pre-distribution. So instead of talking about how much the firm distributes to labor, which is what labor unions, et cetera, have, have addressed in the past, we're addressing the question of who is to be the firm in the first place, capital, labor, the state, or whoever. So it's a very different question. And, and uh, the, the uh, uh, modern treatment of the labor theory of property, which has nothing to do with the labor theory of value, uh, is addresses that question as to who is to be the firm in the first place, the pre-distributed pre question. And uh, the employer, if you, if you look at it in terms of responsibility, the, the uh, 
the employer gets the legal ownership, as I mentioned, of the product and the legal liability for all the inputs. But those are all created by all the people working in the firm. They are the, in fact, uh, cannot alienate that sort of responsibility. And, and uh, so you have a situation where people in the firm are, in factual terms, produce a product, use up the inputs, but get zero percent of that. So they are, as it were, a rented instrument, which is in fact uh, a legal issue as if they were rented things. So those are just standard facts and not, not a, uh, a controversial thing, but you won't, will not hear about this in, in an economics course. So people who work in the firm are in fact de facto responsible, but not legally responsible. They have no legal ownership or legal, legal liability. And the human rental contract, this is the employment contract, the employer employee contract, the master servant contract, or wage labor contract, whatever you wish to call it, is as if the, uh, when, you, when you rent out a car or you rent out an apartment, you turn it over to the per person that's renting it, then they can use it on their own separately. So the wage labor contract, the employment contract, is written as if people could do the same thing, as if they could sort of alienate their responsibility and turn over themselves to be employed, as the word says, by the employer, as if they were a rented instrument. And the critique uh, in the name of the labor theory of property, and <coughs> we'll see labor later, the, the critique of inalienable rights, uh, says that's not what humans can do. So uh, just a few words on the, the intellectual origin of this idea that human responsible agency or human responsibility cannot be alienated. It goes back in, in the modern era uh, to the Protestant Reformation and the idea that you, you cannot alienate the, your decision uh, about your religious beliefs. It's called the doctrine of the inalienability of conscience. Conscience was there, and the word was used then to mean not the sort of internal uh, uh, voice, but, but conscience was your fundamental beliefs in religion. And so Martin Luther made the point that even if you choose to believe whatever the priest or the pope says, virgin birth or whatever, still that is your, your decision to believe that, that you cannot alienate that decision, that no one can believe for another. And the same thing holds, of course, for other human activities. You cannot alienate the decision to produce a widget. You're still a responsible agent when you follow the, the orders uh, of your boss in, in, a, in an employment relationship. That, that, that sort of uh, responsible agency cannot be alienated. In fact, we're not saying you shouldn't alienate it, we say you cannot alienate it. And that's why the employment contract is, is inherently bogus. So all you can do is to voluntarily agree to follow someone else's orders, and as you know, that does not relieve you from responsibility for results you're <coughs> And the good example of that, uh, which the law fully recognizes, is when you have a hired criminal relationship. So you have an ongoing, say, employment relationship, <coughs> and the employer uh, orders you to commit a crime, and uh, you follow the orders as usual. So you're told not to produce a widget, but to kill someone or rob a bank or, or whatever it is. and and uh, as in any of these cases, you do, you do not alienate your own responsible agency for that, and that's fully recognized by the law. So this, this idea that you can't alienate this de facto, this factual responsibility, it's not like a new idea. So here I'm quoting from a uh, British law book uh, published in 1967, still using the, the ancient language, legalese, and master and servant. But all who participate in a crime with guilty intent are liable to punishment. A master and servant and so participate are liable criminally, not because they're master and servant, because the servant has now suddenly become a partner, but because they jointly carried out a criminal enterprise <laughs> and are both criminals. So the obvious question to ask is, well, what about when the enterprise is not criminous? What about when, when they jointly carry out a non-criminal enterprise? That should be the next slide. What happens when they carry out a non-criminal enterprise? Do the employees suddenly turn into robots or machines or something? No, I mean, they're exactly the same people. So they're just as much factually responsible for the, for the uh, uh, joint activity as in the case when they committed a crime. So the, that doesn't change. Well, what changes is the law, because no crime is committed, so the, the legal authorities don't intervene. And instead, you just look at the structure of contracts. Well, the contract is you were rented, and you were paid your wage, and so the, the uh, employer appropriates the whole product. 
the liabilities of which you are one now, and the, the other liabilities, and then the product that was produced. So you get a similar factual performance of, of human beings cooperating together in a joint enterprise, except it's not committing a crime, it's producing widgets or something else, and yet the law treats them totally different. And, and so something weird is going on, and something weird is this contract to, to rent human beings. Now, there's no actual transfer. Uh, this is a important point, and uh, we're not the first ones to point this out. Uh, Ernst uh, Wigfoss uh, is, is, of course, one of the founders of the Swedish uh, social democracy, and uh, Patrick found this incredible quote in uh, the writings of him in 1923. I'd like to read it. Yeah. So there has not been any dearth, in other words, any shortage of attempts to squeeze the labor contract into the shape of an ordinary purchase and sale contract. So when you, you, know, you, you rent a car, then you have this transfer of the services of the car from one person to another. But when you rent a person, there is no such transfer. There is only co-responsible cooperation between human beings. The worker sells his or her labor power and the employer pays an agreed price. But above, above all, from a labor perspective, the invalidity invalidity of the particular contract structure lies in the blindness to the fact that the labor power the worker sells cannot, like other commodities, be separated from the living worker. Here we meet the core of the modern labor question. So in this sense, we're not bringing new ideas to Sweden. We're going back to Eric Wigfoss' original idea, uh, his analysis of the labor contract, saying absolutely that's correct, that, 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 that uh, the, the uh, the labor contract cannot be squeezed into this uh, idea that something that can actually be alienated, a uh, car or apartment or something else uh, from one person to another, that inevitably uh, the, the worker goes along, cannot be separated from the living worker. So uh, as usual, uh, these are not new ideas. These are old ideas which we are modernizing, bringing up to date, and trying to explain more fully. Uh, to reinvigorate the left with a different perspective. So Big Force is making an animal rights argument. He's saying there's something inherently wrong with the contract to alienate labor. That means that the contract to alienate labor is invalid, as he says. It's an invalid contract. <laughs> it's absolutely correct. And, and uh, th that, that uh, therefore, the rights that pertain to labor are inalienable. And, and that includes the rights to the product. Uh, other political theorist, uh, Carol Pateman, uh, is a is a, a good friend. Uh, a, 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 she's still around, and and uh, she wrote a book called *The Sexual Contract*. So the the other contract uh, that has been, if we go over the, the voluntary contracts, have been abolished. The voluntary contract to sell yourself has been abolished, and and uh, the political version of that was what used to be called the Pact of Subjection or Pactum Subjectionis, which was a voluntary contract to give up your rights to govern yourself to the sovereign, Thomas Hobbes, for example. But the third contract that's been abolished is the old coverture marriage contract, where the woman gave up her independent legal personality to the husband, and as the lawyer said, the husband and wife are one person in law, and that one person is the husband. So women can make contracts or own property through the name of the husband, because they're no longer an independent uh, legal personality. So Carol wrote a book called The Sexual Contract, which was sort of analyzing the, the patriarchal structure of society as sort of the coverture marriage contract writ large in society as a whole. And it's become a classic in the feminist literature. And in that book, she absolutely nails it concerning the employment contract. And she says the contractarian argument is unassailable all the time it is accepted the abilities can our abilities can acquire an external relationship to the individual and can be treated as if they were property. In other words, something you can transfer from one person to another. Uh, to treat abilities in this manner is also implicitly to accept the exchange between employer and worker like any other exchange of material property, like when you rent out a car something else. The answer to the question of how property in the person can be contracted out is that no such procedure is possible. So exactly as Vigfor says, there is no such transfer of responsible human agency from employee to employer. It's a bogus contract and should be abolished. Uh, but as she says, no such procedure is possible. Labor, power, capacities, or services cannot be separated from the person of the worker like pieces of property. So uh, 
So the idea is, is uh, also comes, I mean, this comes down in this whole theory of inalienable rights, uh, starting with, with Luther and the inalienability of conscience. It was turned into a political theory of inalienability by Spinoza on the continent and the radical enlightenment and by Francis Hutchinson and the Scottish enlightenment and then Thomas Jefferson, they all paid attention to the Scottish enlightenment, not the English. And so that's how it got into the American Declaration of Independence about inalienable rights. And since then, it's become part of political religion in America, but of course, nobody applies it to what people do all day long. Now, uh, how screwed up is the left? Uh, <laughs> don't get me going on this. <laughs> um, let's, let's just take Marx as, as an example. Uh, certainly Marx would, would be in favor, personally in favor, of abolishing wage labor, at least the private wage labor relationship, but he had no theory that had those implications. He had no theory of animal rights, no uh, uh, theory of uh, labor theory of property. He always developed the labor theory of value. And so he had no theory that would imply the abolition of the labor contract. And what's weird is that it was actually in Hegel, and, and Marx just missed it, but that's another talk. Um, so Marx only had a labor theory of value and exploitation. So the uh, one of the favorite pastimes of neoclassical economists is to critique the labor theory of value, and which is easy to do. And every time you try to talk to an economist about the labor theory of property, they say, oh, you must mean the labor theory of value. That, that, that. So they don't even want to think about the other argument about the inability of responsible agency. They want to just talk about how it's not a good theory of price. And uh, so if you attack the wage labor relationship on the basis of the theory of value, then inherently the critique is, well, workers aren't paid the full value of their labor. And Marx even says this. Here's a uh, quote where Marx is analyzing the role of overtime labor, and he's, he, you can read the quote, but the point is that, that the, he's saying even if, if the workers, that what I put in bold there, are paid the, the, the normal working time before overtime, even if they were paid for at their full value. So he actually has a notion of, of workers being paid the full value. So it's nothing about abolishing wage labor, just paying them their full value which is what neoclassical economists talk about, paying them the value of their marginal productivity. So it's in Marx, and so we in America we call this, he brought a knife to a gunfight. And, and uh, so even if the labor theory of property or value didn't have all these other problems, it still wouldn't have done the job because it's a theory of value. So it doesn't critique the wage-labor relationship itself, it critiques poorly paid, underpaid workers, quote, are not paid for at the, at the full value. So uh, there's no need to go into uh, exegesis of criticizing the labor theory of value. That it wouldn't do the job even if it didn't have all these other problems. And that's not the worst of it. <laughs> so the worst of it is Marx did not understand uh, the reason for the employer's appropriation uh, of the product. And he uh, <coughs> attributed it to private property, which is simply a conceptual error, which I've written about a lot and I won't go into here, but Marx uh, took the feudal relationship where land, the, the, the landowner, the, the lord, uh, as we would say, the, the, what today we call the landlord, was the lord of the land in those days, and had, had governance rights on the basis of land ownership over the people that lived on the land and that worked on the land and owned the fruits of their labor. And Marx simply took that same idea and generalized it to capitalism and, and said, well, that's the rights of capital. And, and uh, that's simply wrong. That's the real key to capitalist appropriation is, is the renting of human beings, not the ownership of private property. So not only that, so Marx then attacked private property thinking that was the, that was the, uh, uh, the problem, which allowed the, the uh, economists and political scientists and so forth, all the apologists for the current system of renting human beings, to parade as if they were the ones that were defending private property, whereas in fact the whole system is based on appropriating the fruits of other people's labor. And appropriating the fruits of your own labor is the only legitimation that's ever been put forward for private property. And it goes from before John Locke, but certainly from him. And the human rental relationship allows you, by renting people, you can appropriate the fruits of their labor. I mean, Locke even had this pun, well, if I bought your labor, then it's the fruits of my labor. And, and which is just a, basically a pun. 
And, and uh, so how screwed up is the left? Well, the left has been criticizing private property, whereas in fact, the system they supposedly should be attacking is based upon violating the basic norm of private property appropriation, getting the fruits of your labor. And, and so, of course, the, the conventional economists love to bring up Marx. Well, this is the, this is the alternative. Marx is the alternative, and he's attacking when we are defending private property. And it's really more a private theft system, as, as Perdon put it, the property as it exists is theft, and, and uh, using this fraudulent contract of many human beings to appropriate the fruits of their labor. So it's violating the very principle of private property. So uh, the last bullet there, the conclusions are that contrary to Marx, the left should be attacking, should be arguing for the abolition, not the nationalization of the whole system of renting human beings in the name of private property. So that's a complete reorientation of the left to, to stop attacking private property in various forms and to say it's in the name of private property that the current system is corrupt. In the name of enable rights, in other words, no right to human beings, just like you can't buy human beings or uh, have coverture marriage contracts and so forth, uh, in the name of enable rights, and of course democracy. I mean, I haven't even started to spell out the democratic theory arguments, but those are, uh, as Patrick uh, suggested in his introduction, are, are, are perfectly clear. So, uh, the alternative to the human rental system is a genuine system of private property and non-fraudulent market contracts where you don't have renting of human beings. Everyone who works in an enterprise would be a member of the enterprise. And here we, we have a, also a language problem. In the ideal case, uh, we would not talk about owning an enterprise. An enterprise should be a social institution where people are members of the same way you have you know, a democratic country your citizens, and, and if you're a resident in Stockholm, you vote in elections, you don't say you own Stockholm, you say you're a citizen, you're, you're a resident here, and so forth. So you need to retool some of the language. And even though we may talk about employee ownership, of course, the idea is not they're not employees anymore, and it's not an ownership relationship at the end of the day. So the people that work in the enterprise are jointly working there and governing them themselves. So give me a few more quotes here. Uh, here is, you know, when do people think about reconstructing society? Well, it's usually after war. And after World War II, a conservative Tory lord, Eustace Percy, a hereditary lord in England, uh, described the fundamental challenge facing the reconstruction of society in an incredible quote. So, uh, so we really have, and just to set up the quote, I've, I've said that the people that work in the enterprise in effect are the party that is really responsible for producing the product, and the product being both the negative part of the liabilities and the positive part. Uh, we're not talking about workers owning the product and somebody else paying the liabilities. We're saying they should be the firm and thus uh, bear those liabilities and own that product. And here, Lord Percy is saying the human association, which in fact produces and distributes as well, the association of workmen, managers, technicians, and directors, is not the association recognized by law. So there's no, it doesn't even exist as a legal association. The association the law does recognize, association of shareholders, creditors, and directors is incapable of production. So forget the whole idea of you know, appropriating future labor. They can't even produce at all. And the law, they're not expected by the law to perform those functions. We should give law to the real association and withdraw meaningless privilege from the imaginary one. So here is a Tory lord in, 1944, uh, just laying it out and, and, and getting, getting it exactly right. And there are a few other people like this. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, so, so the idea here would be one way to convert a firm would be basically to reconstitutionalize the firm, converting the existing owners into debtors, which they are in fact, simply investors, and to reassign the membership in the corporation to the people that work in it. And then labor would be hiring capital instead of the owners of capital renting people working in their firm to appropriate the fruits of their labor. So each firm would be a democratic community of work, industrial republic, if you wish, and uh, the industrial cooperatives in the Mondragon system, which Hope everybody has heard of in the Spanish Basque Country are good examples today. I mean, uh, uh, not, not far from perfect, but some of the best examples around. 
of this. Now, the labor movement uh, in the 19th century in America, when we say labor movement, uh, was not yet focused on collective bargaining. They were focused on abolishing the wage system and to create the cooperative commonwealth. So you had the Knights of Labor, the National Labor Union, and, and uh, that they had uh, exactly the right goal to do away with the whole wage system, not to be uh, wage workers, not to be a woman, not, not to be a rented person, but to be a member in, in a cooperative in, in a cooperative commonwealth. And so the left and the labor movement have, have really been sidetracked for over a century by this whole episode uh, of capitalism versus communism, the whole attack on private property by Marxism. If you go back and read John Stuart Mill, it's very good. Things he was writing in 1849 are radical today. So the left has basically lost a century and a half of, of its moral vision uh, by this whole <coughs> sidetrack through the communist revolution and Marxism. To give you another example, uh, in terms of industrial leaders in America, this uh, remarkable man, Owen D. Young, he was in his day, uh, this was between the wars, uh, World War I, World War II, founder of RCA Radio Corporation of America. He was the chairman of the board and CEO of General Electric, so he was a big shot in, in the industrial world. Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1929. And he gave an address in 1927 at the Harvard Business School, of all places, and this was in that address. Perhaps someday we may be able to organize human beings engaged in a particular undertaking so that they truly will be the employer buying capital as a commodity in the marketplace at the lowest price. If that is realized, human beings will then be entitled to all the profits over the cost of capital. I hope the day will come when the great business organizations will truly belong to the men who are giving their lives and their efforts to them. I care not in what capacity. They will then use capital truly as a tool, and they will be all interested in the working to the, high, to the greatest economic advantage. Now, Jung goes on, because he hasn't you know, touched here upon the, he's touched on the sort of labor theory of property argument that people will be getting what they produce then, but Jung even addresses the democratic argument. Then we, we shall dispose once and for all of the charge that industrial organizations are autocratic and not democratic. Then in a word, Men will be as free in the cooperative undertaking, takings and subject only to the same limitations and chances as men in business in individual businesses. <coughs> then we shall have no hired men. So he's really uh, picking up there on the whole idea that uh, you are your hired person, your rented person, you're an instrument in production, and he's proposing <coughs> this industrial visionary uh, uh, that that this this is something that, that should not be. So Lord Percy and Owen Young are two examples, there's a lot of other examples, laid out visions of the economy of no more rented people. And, and uh, so that's uh, what I'm telling you is not new ideas particularly, but we're going back and finding the right points in the older traditions and to bring that together and to give a uh, new vision to the left that does not make the mistakes of Marxist socialism that is basically uh, screwed up the left for a century and a half. And we not only have uh, the recreating, trying to recreate this vision, but we also have some things to report on practical approach. And so I'll turn it over to my colleague, Chris. Thank you. I spent all that time on the cover. I'm going to leave it. <laughs> show you guys that proud flag on top of the American flag, okay? <laughs> where it deserves to be. Um, and also that, that, that uh, graphic on the left there is, uh, is, is an image from Patrick's film, and this gentleman's film, who produced it. I highly recommend that you uh, take a look at that. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Um, it's an honor. And um, I'm here to talk about the practice side of this, um, as was sort of suggested in the, uh, the setup, uh, David and I started in this business 40 years ago uh, with a nonprofit in the Boston area to actually do this work. Um, and we were both 
very interested in the theory and the practice side of this all those years. Uh, and we have both engaged in theory and practice. David much more in theory, I much more in practice. And so I'm going to sort of tell you some stories and also uh, suggest some ideas, which will hopefully stimulate a good discussion uh, at the end. So here's my agenda. Three categories, background, challenges of action, of doing this, and policy and politics, OK? We've got some framing. We've got some numbers. I want to talk about uh, some of the difficulties in actually doing this work, and then dive into uh, how we talk about this, and how we get anywhere in the current moment with these ideas. That's my intention. So first point is frames. Uh, this fellow, George Lakoff, I highly recommend his work if you haven't heard of him. He uh, writes a lot about politics. Uh, and talks about the, uh, the importance of language and frames and memes, if you want, uh, about how to think of these ideas. And <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking really sort of at two, two points of this talk. And initially, just sort of set this up, and then we're going to come back at the end on this. Because um, here's two frames that we use, or that David and I use, um, that may be of interest to you. These are sort of somewhat culturally specific, but there's there's the frame of economic democracy on the left, which we've talked about and is in the title of this talk. And there's a frame that it's a little hard to see in the small print there of inclusive capitalism. Uh, that's a frame that in some sense is more inviting to business owners and business people as, as they feel like they're living in the capitalist world. And the question is, is there a way of doing capitalism in a more inclusive way? And then, at the end of the day, what do we want to call this? Um, I would suggest to you, it's not the most important thing in the world to have a definitive answer to that question of what to call this before we go and do it. Uh, let future generations decide exactly what the right label should be. These are a couple of frames that are useful in the United States. Uh, they may or may not be here in Sweden. Uh, that, uh, that old gentleman there, uh, Robert Dahl, He's a very eminent political scientist from Yale University who, at the very end of his career, wrote this book, A Preface to Economic Democracy. And it's interesting because he retur he, his, his, the book for which he is famous, most famous, is A Preface to Political Democracy. And sort of following what uh, Patrick said in his setup, uh, this is, a, this is a, in some sense a mainstream liberal guy who I believe has Swedish or Norwegian Norwegian, Norwegian your brothers in, in Norway. Uh, who, at the end of his career, made this case that we can't really have a democratic society unless we have a, a democratic economy that matches a political democracy. So he, he is a, a, was an old a friend of ours and helped get us started. Um, so that's the second frame. The first frame is what do we call this stuff ideologically in some sense, okay? A second frame, a little bit more, uh, uh, more practical, in some sense, is a debate about wealth versus income, or property versus pay. Because what this work is about, particularly when you're beginning to look at it on a practical side, is who owns what. Uh, it's about wealth. It's not about the paycheck. It's about, it's about the, the ownership and governance of firms. So that's a second frame that we need to think about. And if, if, if there's an interest in pursuing these ideas, I highly suggest you spent some time on the wealth inequality side of things. Um, here's the New York Times informing us that inequality is mo most extreme in wealth, not income. It's uh, the top 1% owns most of the economy, most of society. And that needs to be, it's not just that they have bigger bank accounts, but it's how they got the, that money and how they're able to continue to get that money as they sleep. It's because they own things. They have assets. Um, and that's part of the distinction. Quick little statistic from uh, a wonderful Edmund Wolf, who's the premier scholar on wealth inequality in the United States, shows the bottom 90% in red. That's what we own in terms of business equity, financial securities, stocks and mutual funds, trusts, and non-home real estate, which would be agriculture. The top 1% owns most of that. These are all wealth categories. 
again, I think we need to study them and begin to use them and talk about them in our politics. I came up with this homely metaphor in writing a piece about this. If the problem of economic inequality could be likened to an overly deep bowl of soup, then we should be more fairly, that should be more fairly consumed. Income-based solutions attack the challenge with forks. <laughs> we need spoons, asset spoons. Point hopefully clear enough. <laughs> uh, what are key assets for inclusive capitalism? We're going to be talking mostly about the workplace, and we've talked about the workplace. But just to put this in some context, in, in, in some, some familiarity, there's natural resources, land buildings, land trusts, and businesses. Okay? Those are three categories. On the natural resource side, there's interesting stuff going on. Even our craziest of political <laughs> candidates ever, Sarah Palin, was governor of, of Alaska at one point in time. And there is something called the Alaska Permit Fund that was put into law by a Republican that, that provides direct dividends to citizens in Alaska that are related to the, to the royalties and the performance of the private sector that's, that's drilling for oil on their land. So the part of the ownership of those natural resources are shared directly, I should stress, with the citizens. Not by the, it, is not, it is passed through the government. The government oversees that this is done. But the funds do not go to the government. They go to the citizens, which builds, by the way, a constituency for wealth sharing and asset sharing ideas. When everyone is getting a check for $1,654 every year, every man, woman, and child in Alaska gets one of those. Um, it's a brilliant idea. Uh, this fellow is a friend of ours, Peter Barnes, with Liberty and Dividends for All. He has done the most recent work on this, and I happen to like this natural asset the most because we all have these cell phones and so forth, right? The electromagnetic spectrum. Who owns that? Well, the citizens should own that, not the state, and certainly not the corporations who, who buy it and, and, and get control over it for limited periods of time. But these are, these are assets that can be popularly owned. Um, and our, there's not a lot of talk about that. There should be more of it. Um, and then there's the sort of somewhat more traditional, when people have thought about this, about the commons, and again, not necessarily social ownership or state ownership, but of land trusts uh, that are, have been talked about and used by environmentalists to be able to get certain kinds of property out of the market um, and, and to have uh, housing and homes that are, <coughs> that are uh, Oh, no, that way. Pour me a glass of water. Yeah. Um, and then finally we get to the workplace, to the asset sharing side of the workplace. And here we have two stories to tell, and I don't have time to go into too much of it. But uh, this, is, uh, this is by far the biggest one, this thing called ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan, uh, which is actually a form of a retirement plan. Well, let's say this one. Um, form a retirement plan that owns company stock in a tax-favored way. And I'm going to talk about this more. This fellow, Russell Long, uh, was a, is deceased now, is a, a United States Senator from Louisiana. He was the son of a uh, fire-breathing uh, populist politician called Huey Long, who uh, was, who applied his trade as a politician in the late 30s and who was pointing the finger, Huey Long, his, this guy's dad, at Franklin Roosevelt and saying that the New Deal did not do enough and that we had to have share the wealth clubs, that economic inequality was out of control in 1938 um, and that, that stuff, things needed to be do, done to address that. He was, he was pointing the finger at Standard Oil New Jersey and so forth and so on. Well, he was assassinated, which is a whole other story, uh, but his son followed him into politics. And at the very last part of his career, his son wanted to reach back to his father's intentions of, of doing something to make capitalism more fair. And he had control, because he was the head of the Senate Finance Committee, he had significant influence over the tax code. And so he said, what if I introduce incentives to be able to gradually get business owners, to get capitalists, to share ownership of capitalism 
with their workers. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Isn't that what my father was trying to do with share the wealth? And isn't this, in fact, a better idea in some sense? Because you're not just sharing the money, but we're going to be sharing the ownership of companies. we will be sharing the wealth-making machinery of capitalism, not just the dollars and cents. So he said, I'm in charge of, of tax code. If let's 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 figure figure out how to encourage business owners, when, particularly when they reach retirement age, to be able to sell internally to their employees, which raises a question, which is probably in your minds right now, which gets to the secret sauce that, that Patrick talked about. How is that possible? How do people who can barely put enough uh, money on the table to feed their families buy big successful companies? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but Russell Long, with the help of a fellow named Louis Kelso, who's this brilliant attorney who, who worked with him on this, decided that this could be this could be addressed through setting up a, a structure of legal trusts that that any company um, could could introduce could introduce a legal trust that would by law, if they're going to share in the tax incentives, we're going to talk about here. Uh, that, that had to have certain democratic characteristics because the government is about to give up some tax revenue so the government can say you have to do this in a certain way. You can't just have, have David and Patrick in this trust. Everybody in the company has got to be in the trust. So they set up these trusts, employee stock ownership trusts. And the trusts go to the bank to borrow money to be able to buy out the founders of the firm. Workers aren't being asked to come out of pocket with, their, with cash to be able to buy these companies. The trust goes to the bank to do it. Now this is something that sophisticated capitalists have been doing for ages. The LBO field, leverage buyout field, which has happened here as well as in the United States, was constituted almost completely. There's a, there's a certain amount of cash that the five top managers of a company will put in, but the rest of the value of these companies is, is, is uh, of, of the purchase comes through leverage, comes through loans. And so this is, instead of an LBO, we're talking about an EBO, an employee buyout structure. And, and what Russell Long figured out is that there needed to be incentives to get business owners to pay attention to this. Because first of all, they're not gonna believe that the employees could buy them out, they're buy their big successful business. These business owners do have a serious problem, they're getting old, they wanna, begin to cash out, they want to go to retire. Um, and, and they're looking for alternatives. If there in fact can be incentives to be able to sell internally, that would be great, that's what he thought, and it has worked. It's not flawless, it's not without problems, but uh, there's evidence here. So I think I'm gonna show you facts and figures, how about that? To set the context, the United States, and this is a part to, you know, to not overstate my case, We've got a big economy over in the United States, 14 million companies, 155 million workers. Um, and there are in these, there are companies, a million companies of 50 to 500 employees. That's the sweet spot. You've got the sweet spot here. This is what you really need to focus on. 5,000 publicly traded or quoted companies. There's something that can be done with them as well. It's another discussion. And we've got uh, 13 million uh, people in very small businesses. Something could be done there as well, a little bit more complicated. Um, in the United States, um, upper right hand corner, we've got 7,000 companies in effect, 6,717, the last formal count, that are owned by these trusts uh, that, that represent employees. Um, over $1.2 trillion in assets in these trusts collectively, if you put all those 7,000 companies together, with an average of $100,000 per worker in these companies. Wide variation, that's a mean, uh, not a median, but that's, that's what it has meant. It's meant that ordinary workers, in addition to whatever pension or 401k plan they might have, they have a, a, a third leg on the retirement stool of an ESA. Uh, and the practice and the thinking in, the, in, in America is the, these firms, you do need other legs on the stool. You shouldn't have, the workers shouldn't just own stock in their own companies. 
they should ideally have pensions, they should ideally have some other kind of retirement plan. But, they, but for all the reasons we heard from David, and the, some further ones you can hear from me, it should matter to also own the firms. And there are ways of doing that. Uh, here are some examples of companies. The biggest ones I think I've got here at the top 15. A supermarket chain uh, representing 144,000 people based in Florida and Georgia. The second one is a supermarket chain. The third one's a supermarket chain. So retail supermarkets are a very big uh, concentration of this, that's using this idea. Photography studios, a plastics manufacturer, that's another story on that. That one has actually changed. Uh, food distribution. Another supermarket, staffing services, engineering, big engineering construction firm, Parsons, 100% employee of Amstead Industries in Chicago. They manufacture the uh, rail cars, the undercarriages for rail cars. A uh, big company, 10,000 people, 100% um, employee of an engineering company. And this is the people who make Gore Tex, the fabric that some of us might be wearing here in Sweden. Some of you might be wearing in Sweden. 100% employee of these are so these are companies that have done it. Um, this is some of the academic um, performance data. Guess what? Firms that are owned by their employees outperform conventional capitalism. Uh, sales, employment growth, annual growth in sales per employee, that's been studied in a controlled uh, study. Uh, there have been several of them. These same firms, ESOPs, have better rates of return than, than what are called 401k plans, which is a familiar form of retirement plan that just invests in the stock market. ESOPs do better. Um, higher rate of return. I got another data thing here. Uh, ESOPs uh, provide important advantages from the state perspective. Businesses are retained. ESOP companies are 25% more likely to stay in business. Uh, owner, employee owners are four times less likely to be laid off during the last recession which is an interesting statistic. Employees accumulate 2.5 times the retirement assets as employees in other plans, and they receive 5 to 10, 12 percent more in wages. And when a company creates an ESOP, this leads on average to an additional 2.5 percent jobs per year in the company. So this is just some of the academic research. There's a lot more of this that, that I can point you to. If we had time, we don't. Although maybe if we can, if the room isn't being taken away from us afterwards, I've got a four-minute trailer. You can like show you some of the companies, and you can sort of hear. There's three companies that are like uh, that are profiled here. You can get a little bit of a flavor of what this is all about. Um, but we don't have that set up right now. We can do it afterwards. So what's the black box? I've already talked about this somewhat, so I'll, I'll go through it. How do workers, these guys, muscly, muscly men, and diverse workers <laughs> buy from Snidely Whiplash or that sharp looking guy with the tie on there. How is that possible? Uh, well, it's possible because of this trust structure I explained. The trust goes to the bank and borrows money to make this happen. That's how this happens. Uh, and, uh, and there's leverage and it's tax rate. The leverage means loans. It means being, being the trust going to the bank and borrowing. Um, and it's, and it's tax favorite, so it gets the attention of business owners in the first place. Good. Okay. Challenges of action. But doing this. So, what are some problems to do this work? Um, I teach on this stuff. Uh, and it can be a, a sort of a mind-blowing experience, sometimes in academic circles, when people are studying employee ownership. Because you, you get this phenomenon that people really having parallel conversations. It's not like anybody is necessarily wrong, but they usually are getting a very partial part of what this is all about. Uh, because there are four origins to doing this. Some people uh, get acquainted with this idea, so probably some people in this room, uh, through very dr uh, dramatic and, and direct worker control initiatives, like what happened in Argentina um, at the turn of the century. The recuperated factories, workers have t took over factories that had closed, where the owners had abandoned them and gone up into the hills. Uh, workers had uh, took many of those firms over without the bosses there, figured out how to start them, and made many of them successful. There's a wonderful documentary called The Take. It's completely available, thetake.org. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Uh, that's one way 
to do this. These are the four verbs of ownership. A second verb is to start, where people of common values and ideology get together and say, we're going to start a business this way. If Patrick starts a business, I'm going to come back in a couple of years, we're going to see what businesses Patrick starts in, whether it's just owned by Patrick or whether he <laughs> shares it. This is what we'll, we'll see. Uh, he's a young man. Um, but that's another starting point, just to start. A third one, which is, is actually more relevant here in Sweden than it is in the United States right now, is to be able to negotiate uh, in a union management setting shares in exchange for deferring a wage increase or a benefit change or something. And this gets a little bit into the minor world. Uh, sometimes these things are partial ownership, but it's at a firm level. Um, I was involved in the United Airlines uh, employed by it, which some of the older people in the room might remember back 20 years ago or 15 years ago, the, the employees owned 55% of that airline through collective bargaining negotiations. That's a third way this happens. The fourth way this happens, which is the one I've mostly alluded to here today, is when business owners of successful businesses who are on the way out of their careers sell internally to their people. And that's a possible thing to do. Uh, but there are also four meanings of ownership. These are another challenge to action. This is what I meant by going to a conference. And you've got people who are, it's the Tower of Babel. People are sort of talking past you. Well, that's what ownership means. No, this is what ownership means. It means kind of all of this stuff but you'll see the hierarchy. Meaning one is ownership is compensation. That's how some people look at it. This is purely like, you know, what's going to dollars and cents that are going to end up in, in the worker's bank account. Uh, it's really kind of a category error because we're talking about money coming through wealth and assets and not through the paycheck, but that's often how people look at it. The second meaning is, looks like, that's, motor, that's ownership as investment. We have a little problem with our our uh, PowerPoint. Ownership is investment. Where, there, where people look at is, is, this, uh, is the stock in this company performing against its peers? And that's how we, that's how we, that's whether, is this a good idea or not? Depends. We have to look in the stock market pages to see if it's working or not. Okay, not the only way to look at it. Uh, a third way is, is ownership as a, as a benefit. Is if this, if this is introduced through collective bargaining or through legislation, you know, as some, as some way in which workers get ownership as, as a benefit, as an employee benefit. That's in fact most of what is the statistics are that have happened in the United States. And then there's this fourth one, you can't read, that says ownership as membership. Okay, and this gets closer to David's work in terms of, of, of thinking of the firm as a democratic social institution that isn't just invested in or compensated for or a benefit of, but, but where the firm is, is thought of as a democratic social institution to begin with, okay? Uh, and this is, that's how that breaks down. So four meanings, two categories. <coughs> like I just did, ownership is compensation, investment, and benefit. That's looking at the firm through purely property, commodity, and property rights frame. Ownership as membership is looking at the firm as a democratic social institution where it's personal rights and not property rights. We'll talk more about that. Okay, last category. We're back to frames and metaphors, and we're gonna sort of, this is, this is deliberately put out to help provoke good ideological discussion with a bunch of left liberal people here in Sweden, um, <laughs> who we may have given a little indigestion to already, and we'll just a touch more, but maybe you're gonna see what we're saying here. So, uh, public policy ideas. How, how has this happened um, in the United States? Well, here are, some ideas that you can adapt or borrow. Um, you can create trusts that can borrow on behalf of established workforces. That's the American ESOP, ESOP idea. Uh, you can, the government can provide financial guarantees. Uh, some kind of United, we have a United States Employee Ownership Bank bill that Bernie Sanders has introduced that, that my colleagues and I have helped him draft that would provide uh, guarantees to commercial banks who are going to be uh, doing these ESOP loans to encourage it. And uh, my colleague Richard May from American Working Capital is worked on, working on even a more dramatic plan called the Employee, Employee Equity Loan Guarantee Program, which where the government could provide uh, guarantees to workers in firms, similar to the way in which our government at least provides guarantees to people who want to buy homes 
we've uh, recognized that home ownership was an important enough thing that the government helps citizens acquire homes. Shouldn't the government potentially help workers and managers be able to buy into their firms? That's the, that's the Richard May Employee Equity Loan Guarantee Program, which we can talk about. Uh, government procurement is another idea. Can you favor companies in, in, with government purchases that are broad-based employee-owned? Can you say they're going to get more points uh, to be able to uh, get government contracts? And you could do also work on capability, on developing skills for people, having them understand what ownership means, and, and that's what that's all about. So those are some, uh, some policy ideas. Uh, and now, but now we're talking about politics, and this is what's really interesting. Uh, the ideology thing, and I talked about economic democracy or inclusive capitalism. Well, here, what do we got? Who are the two biggest, the two biggest supporters of ESOPs in the United States? <coughs> are Bernie Sanders on the left, and Dana Rohrabacher, who's our most right-wing libertarian congressperson from Orange County in California. Dana Rohrabacher thinks that worker ownership, employee ownership, is broad-based property ownership that will increase the sense of responsibility among the working classes and make them less likely to be dependent upon government. So that's sort of a little bit of a neo-libertarian attachment to the idea, is that, is that this is a way of finally breaking down big government. Let's let people get rich through the economy. Let's help make them capitalists. Okay. <laughs> that's his terminology. I'm I shook the man's hand. As a matter of fact, I shook his hand at a reception, and I, and I said, I, I've told this story before, I said, do you have any idea uh, who else is interested in this here in this congressional building? I said, he said who? He said, Bernie Sanders. Now, this is like 10 years ago before Bernie, Bernie Redford. And he was a little stunned. And he looked at me and he says, Bernie? And I said, yeah, Bernie. He goes, he thought, he says, well, you know, I've always said, Bernie, Bernie's a, Bernie's a patriot, like me. We can get along with this idea. Um, and this is, so this shows you. There's a, I, I call this, there's an ideological ambidextrousness to this idea of ownership. Right-wing and conservative people can see it for, for perfectly legitimate, if partial, reasons. And some left-wing people, I mean, Bernie, in, in a category error, <clears throat> thinks it's socialism, democratic socialism. I plan to sit down and relieve him of that category. In fact, I tried to. I literally drafted language for his speech at the Democratic Convention, which he didn't use. Um, <laughs> but, but so, so what's the what? It, it, this isn't necessarily a compromise between socialism and capitalism. I liked it before I thought that. It's calling this what it is: economic democracy, calling it the unfinished business of democratic life. Uh, which is what that, that old Yale professor did. Um, so, how to think about this in, in our sort of left liberal nomenclature now? I think I'm talking to kind of this crowd. Well, here's, this is a category I have to sort of introduce. This is a gentleman who's still alive, Yaroslav Vanyek from Czechoslov old Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, uh, who wrote this book and gave us a meme, okay? He gave us uh, a, a category here. Uh, he, he wrote a book called The General Theory of Labor Managed Market Economies. And what this work is about, in, in some important way, is exactly that. It's attacking the employment relationship, the power relationships of the workplace. It's not attacking the market. As I like to say, the market is a stupid beast that you regulate. It's doing the wrong thing, you tell it to stop doing that thing. Uh, the market is not the enemy. It's the employment relationship. And, and here, uh, one of our first academics over here wrote a whole book about how would the world look if we had la labor-managed market economies, which, as you see in the next slide, um, are regulated by political states. Um, LMME. So what are the political distinctions we maybe should talk about here? There's the labor-managed market. The first distinction that I think is key for the left, excuse me, is that there's a line here between these two things. And that we distinguish between our concepts of, of an economy and concepts of a polity or a state. And 
the economy should be a labor managed market economy, which is regulated by a liberal state. Uh, there's, there should be markets, but because markets can, can be manipulative and can be manipulated, there should be regulation that, that prevents them from doing bad things. Uh, that's a distinction between positive power, if you will, of starting a business in a certain way, and negative power, telling what you can't do. That's the difference between, between yes and no. And I, I like to think, um, I was thought about this some, this is a very simple sort of distinction, but it's like, if you're talking to undergraduates or something, like, you know, like people starting out in life, figure out, it's a part of personality thing. Are you a yes person or a no person? <laughs> you know? Because there's really important work to be done by both sides. One is not more important than the other. You know, so are you somebody who wants to like sort of jump in and start something? Is that your skill set? Is that your, your, your personality? Or are you somebody who like, let's slow down and make sure we're doing this right? Both are important. But what's most important is that there's a line between the two. And that we don't sort of fuse these things which a lot of socialist thinking and socialist practice has done. And that's a big problem. Um, so the firm level, only, you know, okay, so now, finally, to our friends at the labor movement, and I teach at the Harvard Trade Union program, <coughs> the, the ideas I'm about to give are not sanctioned by the Harvard Trade Union program, <laughs> uh, but they've heard from me for many years. So what's the role of unions in all of this? Well, I'm glad David, did the work of reminding us, as I bet you is the case here in Sweden, that the first fans, the first enthusiasts of these ideas were, in our case, our 19th century, early 19th century labor movement. The Knights of Labor and the National Labor Union were the name of those, those labor organizations. They preceded the AFL-CIO. Uh, they, they were attacking this new system of industrialization that created the wage worker. And these labor leaders said this wage thing, this collective bargaining thing is totally screwed up. We don't want to go there. We don't want to be separated in that way. We want the purpose of a labor movement is to enable people to come together and take control of their own destiny and to, and to have democratic economies. That's what Terence Powderly and William Silvis and different leaders in those early unions did. I bet you those people exist in your history books for your labor movement. Um, but let's talk about the role however, of a union. Because a, a, the idea of you know, the unions encouraging this is, is one thing, ideologically and politically, which I would hope they will rem remember their history. But then it's a matter of like, okay, how do we actually do this? So we got, we've got these worker-owned firms, these labor-owned firms. How, how do we, you know, make sure they're democratic? How do we make sure they're doing the right thing? Well, the first, that's the first firm level internal role of, of a union is to be the guarantor of democracy within the firm. Is to be, one metaphor that David has used in a, in a paper called The Union is Legitimate Opposition, is to be, is to be the sort of parliament, a little bit of a parliamentary democracy within the firm, if you will, where the union's role is to be able to critique the business plan, the annual plan put forward by management about what we're going to do with our firm. Generally, workers as a group aren't, aren't, aren't necessarily trained or qualified. They don't have the resources to be able to critique management plans. And so you can have a 100% worker on firm and managers getting up at the end of the year and saying, this is what we're going to do with our money. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, okay, okay, you know. And they maybe have had a vote to elect the board of directors, and that's good. You know, uh, but they haven't had a substantive engagement with the issues. That is the role of the union. The role of the union is to be an agent to work with workers within the firms to be able to critique business plans, not to not to uh, <laughs> defeat them. Sometimes the business plans are going to be smart and right. Other times they're not. Uh, and the role of the union is to have pe skilled people who can work with workers at an individual firm level to evaluate these, these things. And then, at a society level, we know this, is, this all isn't going to happen without debate, without meetings like this that is happening because of the labor movement, 
paying for the room. Um, there, there needs to be, the labor movement needs to be represented in debates with capital and the state about what we're going to do with our economy. What the, what's the future of capitalism or whatever the hell we're going to call it? What's the future of our economy? Individual workers and individual firms, or even groups of workers within those firms, aren't well positioned to engage in that debate. Um, a labor movement that's taking these ideas seriously is, and can work with the politicians and the political parties in particular who are interested in these ideas. So here is a, here in a distinction in a very, between an internal role and an external role, both of which are key. I think that might be it. Right, so role of unions, internal, Internal, this is just summarizing, is to debate the plans at an individual firm level. Externally, it's to debate with capital and the state about where we're going, where you're going. And finally, an advert for some friends. <laughs> David Ellerman isn't my only friend wearing books <laughs> in this field. This is a wonderful book. Beyond the Corporation, Humanity Working, David Ertl in Scotland, fabulous book, which goes into all of this. And The Citizen Share, my colleagues at Keisha Rutgers, Joseph Blasey, who's been a friend forever, Richard Freeman, and Doug Cruz, um, Alan Blinder and uh, Piketty have, have given blurbs to this. Um, that's something for people who want to dig in further on these ideas, and that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris and David. So I'm also the, the, one of the authors for the last book, Richard Freeman, has written uh, an article for the Swedish LO, uh, which I also recommend, which is kind of uh, connected the whole topic to a Swedish uh, context. I think it's called worker ownership and uh, profit sharing or something like that. Um, so now we'll be hearing from Osa Odin Ekman uh, from the Social Democrats. Thank you. Um, thank you for two incredibly interesting presentations. Um, I'm politically active. Uh, I hope that doesn't mean that I am inherently a no-sayer or like inherently regressive in the debate on uh, economic democracy. But I am very much here somehow in the capacity of someone interested in sort of political aspects of this all. Um, and I think as pretty much everyone in this room is aware of, economic democracy is probably not at the center of the Swedish left-wing debate today. It's not really a kind of vehicle of our progressive agenda, uh, talking about how exactly uh, to organize the economy on a more fundamental way, in a different way. That doesn't mean that we don't have a tradition uh, of sort of forms of economic democracy. We have a strong tradition of cooperatives, but uh, as, as was pointed out in the introduction, a large part of our sort of debate on uh, economic democracy effectively died with a proposal on uh, wage earner funds, and it has been very much uh, dormant since then. Um, so I think this is a really interesting occasion to sort of revive that debate and to sort of examine um, some of the arguments uh, on this. Um, another way in which I think that we do actually confront some of the issues that you've, um, that you've raised is through the trade union movement. I mean, it's not, uh, the trade union movement on a daily basis does try to exert influence and power in the workplace. It does try to take, in some ways at least, some of the power over working conditions and the organization of work. It doesn't do so by altering the actual sort of ownership relationship, but it does in a very practical way um, try to do that on a daily basis in workplaces all over. Um, so the question is, should this other tradition of trying to sort of alter, alter the ownership structure, is that something that we should focus on? Is that, should that be our agenda moving forward? And I think that there are lots of reasons for considering that. Um, I think uh, some of the examples that you've uh, raised and some of the sort of empirical outcomes in the United States, uh, where you see better working conditions, um, indeed, better uh, economic performance of some of the companies is very interesting. We would always argue in Sweden that there is a link between these two, and that's part of why we, uh, why we sort of point out, or sort of, that's one of the benefits that we tend to point out with the Swedish sort of labor market model, um, that it forces up working conditions and raises wages, and that this has a kind of, it contributes to a kind of dynamism in the economy that ultimately leads to better economic outcomes. 
Um, I think there are some other reasons. Um, when, a, when a sort of firm or workplace operates and sort of uh, or it builds on economic democracy, it's more grounded in the place where it operates. Um, a firm won't move to another country, it won't try to blackmail the state to try to get the most beneficial uh, regulation, it won't operate in exactly the same kind of destructive ways that capitalist firms can do today. It won't operate with the same kind of short-term takeovers of other companies. There are a lot of things that capitalism does that, um, that more democratic uh, democratically run uh, firms wouldn't do. I also think that there are some specific economic problems that, for example, cooperatives might be better placed to try to solve. Um, if you look at Stockholm today, for example, we have a huge housing crisis. And not just a sort of shortage of housing, we also have a shortage of affordable housing. And on the one hand, of course, we have big capitalist firms who um, are able to use this sort of this shortage situation to really uh, make a very, turn over a very good profit. But you also have the sort of publicly owned firms. They are obliged, sort of by EU law and all sorts of regulations, to also operate on a sort of profit maximizing principle, which makes, kind of squeezes out uh, possibilities of really politically uh, creating solutions for affordable housing. And I've read some interesting ideas on how like cooperatives could fill uh, a very important role uh, in, in this situation because they can, of course, operate on a different logic and sort of with other, other aims um, beyond profit maximization. Um, and one of, the, one of the big challenges, I think, however, especially if you want to look at it from sort of uh, why unions maybe aren't pursuing uh, this specifically as their as their agenda or as their big project is that actually trade unions are very much struggling to protect the employer employee relationship which is being undermined in a lot of very very problematic ways today um, I mean both in terms of full self-employment where uh, what used to be a worker ends up having to take full responsibility for uh, social security and one and all costs of um, all the costs are sort of put on the worker, but it's sort of masked as a sort of self-employment um, kind of setup. That's one thing, but you also have the sort of rise of what is sometimes called the sharing economy, which is a totally bogus term for what is a very capitalist industry, uh, where you can either use sort of apps, you might call it the platform economy, but you sometimes also call it a sort of gig economy. Um, I mean, all of these are different sort of uh, mechanisms through which the employment relationship is is being challenged and where I think it's quite natural in a lot of ways that trade unions have focused a lot of their efforts on uh, upholding that relationship uh, and trying to secure a lot of the benefits that come with the position of being an employee. Um, so I think that there are a lot of uh, I don't want to be a no-sayer, but there are some reasons why this has perhaps not been at the very front of the agenda. And I think that the main challenge that I would really like you to maybe develop a little bit when you, um, when you get the chance is, how, how do you really solve the problem of participation? I'm not sure I completely follow this idea of what, what roles the unions would, would fill in this, in this kind of situation. Um, because for me, unions are organizations that represent uh, workers that don't necessarily that don't own, uh, that are not capitalists or that don't own capital. And if you, again, if you sort of start to model these, these categories up, um, at what point is the union uh, either internally or externally in the big sort of public debate that you mentioned is one of the sort of purposes of having a union, what point are they representing capital? At what point are they representing workers? I mean, there's, there are to me, there, there are a lot of sort of alarm bells <laughs> ringing, but I'm sure I'm sure there is a very uh, great constructive uh, <laughs> solution for this. I don't want to like uh, <laughs> reject it uh, <laughs> right away, but um, uh, but I think I mean, as became very clear uh, during, especially during the second presentation, this the sort of models that you are, or the sort of the models that you're proposing do very much operate on a market logic, and. I see that that maybe is a most doable solution, you know, or the most doable way forward, the most feasible way forward. But I mean, it is still very, very difficult and quite problematic because a lot of uh, the sort of negative and destructive consequences 
of market capitalism will also be in place. Just because you have changed some of the uh, ownership doesn't necessarily make it a sort of progressive force or progressive entity. I think there may be asset sharing models that have a high rate of participation of the workers, but you have to be quite specific about how, how that will work in practice, because otherwise, you know, there's nothing that inherently says that a company where a lot of the employees have a high sort of stock ownership, for example, they will be behaving in any other way uh, than, um, than a capitalist firm on a regular sort of capitalist um, economy. Um, so, I would say that I think um, it would also it would it's it's problematic to be, to build the case for sort of the progressive case being uh, finding new ways to operate on market logic and the sort of more reactionary method being somehow regulation by the state because I thought there was a bit of a dichotomy that was being brought up to me a very important sort of broad part of what the left strategy for an alternative economic <coughs> vision has been to shield people from a lot of the negative outcomes of the market. That's the kind of fundamental part of a sort of decommodification agenda, to make sure that people are shielded from some of the risks, that people are shielded um, from a lot of the negative consequences. And I think, um, therefore, that a sort of vision for an alternative economic sort of system has to also build on being able to sort of create positive alternatives operating outside of market logic. Um, and that, that sort of sphere can't be automatically deemed kind of, uh, sort of just a sort of regulating force or with, a withdrawing force. Um, that would be sort of my, my, my main criticism. But like I said, I'm an essayer, so please, uh, please convince me, um, and I'll be very happy to uh, uh, take on that as a new kind of agenda for the... Uh, Say speech. yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Thank you. So nice to see you all here. Uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizers of this uh, seminar and all the participants. Uh, economic democracy is a topic uh, way too little uh, examined and uh, debated, so I'm very happy to uh, be here. I was asked to say something about uh, trade unions' uh, engagement in uh, matters concerning uh, economic democracy and uh, workers' own enterprises. And having seen the film, uh, we, can we do it ourselves? I guess the underlying question is, why don't you do more? Uh, and uh, even though I am not here as a spokesperson of Handels or the Union of Commercial Employees, I will try to elaborate on this. But before I go into that, I would like to reflect a bit, little bit about, uh, upon this uh, lecture. In Sweden, we have... Uh, within the social democratic movement, a long tradition of talking about uh, democratization as a process of three steps. Political democracy, social democracy, and uh, economic uh, democracy. And this has been become the, the, the third step that never, that is still, is wait, is still waiting to happen, so to speak has become some kind of a magic formula that we don't, uh, that we very rarely specify what we mean when we talk about economic uh, uh, democracy. Sometimes I guess it's just a trick to avoid talking about another word that we don't want to specify what we mean with, namely socialism. Because in Sweden, uh, the discussion about economic democracy has been taken place within a socialist uh, context. And I think we could probably have a two-hour seminar just discussing what do we mean by economic uh, democracy. I think that would be very fruitful uh, because by what, based on what we mean, based on what, we're, what it is that we try to achieve, we will evaluate the practical uh, experiments within this field uh, differently. Uh, Professor Mackin talked about inclusive capitalism, pretty far from uh, socialism. 
when I was studying your work, when preparing for this uh, seminar, I myself came up with the term uh, participatory capitalism. At the same time, when you might watch the film, Can We Do It Ourselves? Uh, there is another American theoretician, David Schweikart, uh, uh, performing in this film. He has written a book called After Capitalism. So evidently, we are talking about economic democracy uh, with different aims, and maybe the most um, the, the, the most clear example of this is when you bring up here uh, this uh, Rohrbacher uh, person and Bernie Sanders. They are uh, they are positive towards the same thing, but evidently it's very different developments they would like to see uh, using that. And I don't think it's uh, necessarily a good thing that people who disagree on everything uh, do agree on this. <laughs> uh, I, but my, my reflections upon this, I would like to pose as five questions. These questions are not uh, necessarily aimed at someone specific, but questions that we could all take with us and reflect upon. First, if workers rent money or capital and pay interest to the investor, investors, doesn't power over production then stay with the investors? The workers would be dependent upon pleasing the investors by maximizing the return of their investments. Secondly, even if the workers running an enterprise would own the means of production they use and thus be independent of external investors, would their acting space not be confined by the action of competing capitalist firms? As long as there are competing companies that seek to maximize profits, it would be bad for business to pay labor more than the competitors do. Third, why would workers owned enterprises operating on a market, even if there were no capitalist firms, not start acting like capitalist firms seeking to lower the cost of labor power? It is not the greed of capitalists that make them strive for maximum profit. Um, it is the risk of losing to a competitor. In fact, the good thing about market economy is that it, through competition, forces each producer to lower uh, the costs of production and thus allocates resources effectively. You can't have the positive effects of market economy without having competition and thus the risk of being driven out of business. Fourth. To what extent do workers control production if they still have to produce what can be sold with the biggest profit on the market? Human needs and conscious democratic decision making, making do still not rule production. You still have to produce what can be sold, not what meets the most urgent human needs. And fifth, can exchange values domination over use value be broken as long as we produce for exchange on the market? Let's not try to agree whether Marxist socialism is a sidetrack, a dead end or not. I only have five minutes. But one thing that Marx pointed out was the double nature of the commodity produced for exchange. Qualitative use value and quantitative exchange value. When we produce for exchange, exchange value rules over use value. Abstract labor rules over concrete labor. That division is not overcome just because decision-making with within the enterprise is organized as one worker, one vote. I am, as you might understand, afraid that the changes proposed here are not enough. That democratically organized enterprises would still be subject to capital's logic. And then it's a, a different discussion whether we find that a problem or not. But you might guess that I do. <laughs> but then, to the question of the trade union's engagement with economic democracy. In the statutes of my union, it says that the task of the union is to protect the interests of the members on the labor market, in the business world, and to promote a societal development based on political, social, and economic democracy. So, evidently, this really is a question that concerns and should concern us. But 
We must remember that Swedish unions have an influence on wages and working conditions for people generally in Sweden. Not just a unionized minority, but we are losing the grip. The organization rate has fallen. In some sectors, it has even been discussed whether the unions can fulfill their task of regulating wages and working conditions. Therefore, the number one priority for Swedish unions, most certainly among low-paid and blue-collar workers, is to re-establish control of the situation. It's been interesting to get to know more about the workers' owned enterprises in the US. But to be frank, when I look at the US, I don't envy you because of your six or seven thousand ESOPs. I feel sorry for the millions of working poor, the millions and millions working in private capitalist firms without a sectoral collective agreement, the low union density. We have to direct all our efforts to avoid such a development here. There is a present-day reality that we have to deal with. You could, of course, discuss whether unions in an ideal future should bargain collective agreements or not. But without collective agreements, the working class would be much weaker today. So the labor movement is on the defensive and must give, prior give priority to the defensive struggle. Remember that the struggle for wage earners funds was launched when the unions were at their strongest and grew stronger by each day. Having said that, we must prepare for an offensive struggle. One reason why the wage earner funds failed was that the plan was elaborated too late. We must initiate a discussion about and elaborate a strategy for economic democracy. I believe a reformist strategy for economic democracy would need to be built on many components. Public ownership of strategic resources would have to increase. The dependence on private investors must be limited. Here pension funds could play a role. And demand for commodities that satisfy prioritized human needs must be stimulated by political means. Also, we would need to experiment with democratic decision making within enterprises. According to Swedish tradition, I think there are two natural starting points. We are used to organizing civil society in democratic associations. If we do sports, we are members of an association. If we rent our apartments, we're part of the tenants association. If we own our, uh, our housing, we're, we form an association with our neighbors, and so on. Therefore, workers' cooperatives should be something to explore, and a natural starting point in a Swedish context. Also, we have a big public sector in Sweden. It's hard to find an arena more suitable for developing ways of running an enterprise democratically. Now that the new public management is finally being questioned, I hope that this perspective is remembered when you're looking for alternatives to new public management. The alternative of democratizing a uh, public sector. Thank you. Yeah, well, there's a lot uh, laid out there. Let me... Um start with this thing about the role of the union in the uh, democratic firm. There is no democratic theory of a one-party democracy. There's never been one-party democracy. And Marxism has certainly proven that throughout history. And so have a democratic firm, you need a lot more than just having the people in the firm elect the management. Because then when management carries out all the usual abuses of power that humans are prone to, you need some protected voice of counterpower, some protected voice of grievance procedures, of proposing alternative business plans, and so forth. So you need what in political theory is called a legitimate opposition. In the British democratic theory has most developed this concept. You have the whole idea of the shadow government that proposes alternatives to what the government is. And this would be a natural role for the organization of workers within the firm separate from management. And that's what in Mondragon is called the social councils that Chris mentioned. And that is the natural role for unions to take. The, the electing the board of directors uh, is nowhere near enough because when even you know, we, we go and in, get into firms and, and the union officials say, okay, we'll elect the board of directors and we'll get on the board of directors and represent the workers. 
Well, that means that you're the ones that are selecting managers. So when managers screw up, then it's your manager that you selected. So the union has neutralized its role to be able to come back and say, well, you know, we need to uh, stop with this manager, even though he's our representative. So unions get caught into this bind of thinking, well, they should be on the board, but they also need to do uh, represent the workers in various procedures and so forth. And so we suggest a separate separation of those roles that. Uh, all the workers elect the management, but you have a protected role for dissent, a protected role for guaranteeing workers' rights. And that is what addresses the question raised about how do you protect participatory rights in a democracy you don't have a one-party democracy, but a legitimate opposition, and that's the role union plays. A lot of the other um, comments were about things that I would call baggage left over from the whole Marxist socialist era, about capitalist behavior and so forth. If you look at Patrick's film, uh, Bo uh, Wallstein is very clear. The capitalism is not about markets. Capitalism is about a structure, the firm. So talking about capitalist market behavior is, is simply a, a misnomer. People don't know what capitalism is. Of course you have competition between firms and, and uh, in all the ways in which firms compete. But the idea that, that uh, you know, trying to cut costs or, or trying to outcompete your competitors is capitalist behavior is, is a rubbish. Capitalism is about the firm, how the firm is structured. And in any market situation, you're going to have competition, you're going to have all the usual things that need regulation by the state. But the idea that somehow we can have a uh, you know, economic democracy without a market, without competition, is well into the dustbin of history. And, and uh, so this whole, this whole idea of, well, they might reproduce capitalist behavior is, is, is a misnomer. So, uh, that gets into some of these five points uh, made by the second uh, uh, speaker. Um, I, th I think it's better not to go over them one by one, let Chris have a, have a say here. But, uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're really trying to be clear that this is not a warmed over version of Marxism. We're talking about a quite different approach of the left. And it doesn't address a lot of these pseudo complaints that Marxists have about markets and all that. That is, aside, markets have proven historically their usefulness. They, they have to be regulated. They are they are an instrument of social allocation of resources and so forth. And the markets are not the enemy. The renting of human beings is the enemy, and that's about the structure of the firm, not about the structure of markets. I'm going to be just a little bit nicer. Remember, it's a team in here. What day is this thing? Tuesday. Tuesday, I'm the nice guy. Actually, the name, what's your name? Hosan. Hosan? Hosan. What's up? What's up? Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to try to try to take one one from each of your things. So, so one of one of the uh, entirely um, well-intended and, and historical uh, sort of themes that you you brought up is that is it is it part of the role of the labor movement to um, I want to get your words right here um, is to shield people from the market. And um, you're a woman, but excuse me, that's, I find that to be paternalistic. Um, I, think, I, I don't think it's the role of a labor movement to shield people in the market. I think it's the role of labor movement to do battle in the market um, at an individual firm level to make sure justice is being done and at a macro level to make sure justice is being done. Um, I think we need to have more voice, more power, more debate, more contention at the firm level and at the macro level. And there's plenty of work for unions to do at the firm level and at the macro level. Because, they're, because guess what? Um, these sorts of changes that we're imagining here, a labor-managed market economy regulated by a liberal state, aren't going to just come in because of some persuasive lecture that's been given. You know, there are people who are going to be resisting this, and do resist it, tooth and nail, for the, for the sort of colorful, you know, capitalist pig reasons that you know we can all, if in certain attitudes we can we could we could point to those people. But I'm here also to tell you, somebody who's for 40 years been out in the real world doing this. That guess what? Every all people who and you're not saying this. So be be fair. All people we might call capitalists are not pigs. 
Yeah. There's some very decent people. Owen Young, got CEO of General Electric, wanted a future where there would be no hired men. Um, you know, and, I, and you could read the speech, and you know, there, there's some sincerity there. But the, but the basic assumption of the social role of the labor movement is to shield workers from the market, I, I find problematic. Uh, because I think it's time to contend and, and to fight, and I, and I mean fight it out in a d democratic debate way, to sort of break down some of these stereotypes. And, and in fact, you'll find that some capitalists are going to be on your side debating some other kinds of capitalists who are, you know, who are the greedy people who don't want to give up power. And you, will, and you will find, and I detected some of this in both of your comments, that you don't want the company of those people. You want to keep them on the other side of the room or in a different room. I think that's a mistake. I think there are Wiskorfs and there are Owen Youngs and there are people who you, you recruit to this sort of project of economic democracy. And the building of that project is not just the property of a labor movement. It's the property of politics, it's the property of, of business owners and of workers. So that's one point. And then the second, more trying to speak to the gentleman, I'm not going to try to torture your name. Uh, with my bad Swedish. Um, and you also do it a little bit short, so we don't show. Okay, yeah, real, real quick. Is it because it's one thing? I mean, I think a a uh, a basic assumption of a purpose of the labor movement, which I embrace at a still still at a certain level. I understand we can, can sort of operate intellectually at more than one level at a time here. Uh, but but I think it's flawed. Is that the purpose of a labor movement is to take wages out of competition? You know that we don't want competition. On wages, and um, here's that's it's it's complicated. I, I I prefer that in some sense, and in fact maybe you know with the under Roman numeral two here, when we're sort of debating all this out, we can in fact make the wage part of the of the story you know even. But here's the important point: is that you talk about a democratic firm, there are really t very two serious economic bites at the apple. One is what you're getting in the paycheck, and the second is what you're getting in profits, if you own the firm. Uh, and and if, if these are 100% employee-owned firms, we have to take that in mind. And they are in competition, and sometimes, guess what? It makes sense to have wages be competitive with, with uh, Belgium or Morocco. You know, and that isn't necessarily the end of the world if the, fir if the workers own the firms. Because if they succeed, they're getting that second bite of the apple, they're getting the profits. So that's another sort of a big think thing we have to wrestle with, is that what is what is the future like when we're not just um, fighting for wages, but when we're fighting for ownership, and when we're fighting for ownership, we have that second bite of the apple. So.